Lux presents Hollywood. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, bring you the Lux Radio Theater. Starring Alan Ladd, Howard De Silva, McDonald Carey, and Wanda Hendricks in Two Years Before the Mass. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. While naturally I don't know what your reading preferences are, I'm quite sure that almost all of us have at some time in our lives thrilled to the story of Two Years Before the Mass, Richard Henry Dana's violent saga of adventure on the high seas. Tonight we present the first screen version of Two Years Before the Mass from Paramount Studios with four of Paramount's outstanding stars. Alan Ladd, Howard De Silva, McDonald Carey, and Wanda Hendricks. If you remember Dana's book, you may recall that when he arrived in California from around the Cape, one thing which impressed him was, and I quote, the beautiful complexions of its women, which they guarded with large mantillas worn about the head. Well, I'm sure visitors to California are still impressed by the loveliness of our women who nowadays guard those beautiful complexions with Lux soap rather than with mantillas. However, that can't be said of California only. Lux soap and beautiful complexions go together wherever wise and lovely women live. It's time to weigh anchor with Two Years Before the Mast, starring Alan Ladd as Charles, Howard De Silva as Captain Thompson, MacDonald Carey as Dana, and Wanda Hendricks as Maria. Boston Harbor, 1835. The Brig Pilgrim has just tied up at the wharves of the Stewart Shipping Company after a record-breaking voyage from California. First to board her is the ship's owner, who goes at once to the cabin of Captain Thompson. Captain Thompson, congratulations, congratulations. Thank you, thank you, sir. 130 days out of Monterey. It'll be a long time before anyone breaks this record. I'll break it myself, Mr. Stewart. Someday I intend to set a record that no sailing ship will ever equal. Here are the ship's papers, sir. Oh, and uh, a death certificate, one of the crew. Another death? Yes, two days off Rio. I buried him at sea. Couldn't you have put him ashore? That would have meant entering and clearing a foreign port. It would have cost five days of good wind without knowing if the man would have benefited. I don't question your judgment, Thank Captain. you, Miss... What are you looking at, Mr. Stewart? That document on the wall. That document is my dismissal from the United States Navy. A unique ornament, is it not? Let me read it to you. Mr. Francis Thompson, late captain, United States Navy, New York. Sir, you are hereby dismissed from the Naval Service of the United States. They waste no words, do they? I, uh, I I'll sign your papers, Captain. Uh, Mrs. Stewart and I would like very much for you to join us at dinner this evening. I wish I could accept, sir, but I'll not be able to. My son is home for a change. I'd like for Charles to meet you. It would do him good. He may not be aboard ship as long as we're in port. If he cares to visit the pilgrim... You don't know, Charles. He has time only for gambling and carousing. However... I consider it a favor if you'll have the ship loaded for sea as soon as possible. The cargo is all ready. You may sail as soon as you sign the crew. Oh, there's one bothersome item. I've been asked to have you put in at Pernambuco, Brazil, and pick up two passengers for San Francisco. Pass- passengers? The ship isn't fitted to carry passengers. I know, but one of them's related to an important official we can't risk offending. May I put it at Monterey first? By all means, try for your record. I'm sorry about this, Captain. It's bound to delay you. I'll still break the record. Well, I'll see you tomorrow, Captain. Good day, sir. Mr. Armazine. Aye, sir. Come here. With any luck, we'll serve before the end of the week. Resign the old crew. I'll have trouble doing that, sir. We'll get those you can. Replace the others. We'll need 15 new men at least, sir. We'll see that you get them, Mr. Armazine. <laughs> Now, look here, Charles. I appreciate your showing us the Boston waterfront, but after all... What's the matter, Harry? Is tavern a little too rough for you? I uh, thought you were going to show us your father's ship. Yes, the one that broke the record. Later, maybe. But you said she was sailing at midnight. Well, let her sail. Right now, I'm going to have another drink. Oh, waiter. <laughs> Not a serious thought in your head, is there, Charles? When are you going to settle down and go to work? 
You know, I have it all figured out. Never. I have all the time in the world and my father all the money. He'll make it. I'll spend it. Uh, suppose you spend it in some other place than this. Come on, let's get out of here. Oh, sit down, my friend. We're going to have another drink. <laughs> Now, don't upset yourself, Mr. Amazine. I promised I'd find you 15 men for the Pilgrim, and 15 I'll deliver. The Pilgrim sails at midnight tonight, Mr. Bowler, tonight. We're paying you to get us a crew. Uh, still two hours. Now, uh, let's see. We brought nine men aboard that floating piece of perdition already. <laughs> poor, poor lad. It's wicked enough to Shanghai men, Mr. Amazine, let alone to serve on the Pilgrim. Shut up, Bowler. You'll wake up at sea with the rest of them. Uh, uh, now then, nine men at $12 each comes to You'll us. get your money when we've got the others. Come on. Let's get over to the bar. <laughs> Break out the rum, barkeep. A drink for every man in the shadow. Drink up, mate. Drink up. Compliments to the finest brig that ever dropped hook in Boston Harbor. Wait a minute. You wouldn't be looking for a crew, would you? I'm signing Cracker Jack Seaman for a champion passage around the horn. Mister, we know your ship. She's a bad ship and a hungry one. I don't have none of your rum. Don't listen to him, men. Who will drink with me? I will. I will. And what's more, I'll sail on your ship. You're Mr. Amazine, aren't you? That's right, mate. What's your name? Richard Dana. Oh, uh, you're making mistakes, sailor. I don't think so. What did you say? Oh, I was just advising that gentleman not to sign on the pilgrim. Were you now? <laughs> Look at him, mates. A daisy. Lace on his shirt. Get out of here. In good time, but first I'd like to talk to that sailor. I said get out of here. Move aside, Mr. Amazon. I'll teach you to butt in fancy drawers. <laughs> oh, so he's a fighter, is he? Stand back, lads, and watch the fun. <laughs> On deck. All hands on deck. Crews on deck, Captain Thompson. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Amazon. All hands. Attention. Attention. Gentlemen. We've been at sea a few hours only, but it has already come to my attention that some of you have stated that you boarded my ship against your will. That is a lie. And I will tolerate no repetition of it. Every one of you has either signed his name or made his mark agreeing to sail. I made no mark, nor did half of us. I was he did it, sir. Shanghai. I will pretend that neither of you men were so foolish as to interrupt me. Those who are new aboard will soon learn that I demand but one thing of a crew. Complete submission to authority. Authority being vested in myself, in Mr. Amazine, the first officer, and in Mr. Foster, the second officer. Mr. Foster, do you have the prisoner? Aye, sir. Peter Bellmer. And what's the charge? Finding himself aboard ship, he attacked Mr. Amazine with a knife. Mm-hmm. Bellamer, the punishment for attacking an officer is 20 lashes, well laid on, and you will be confined in chains on quarter rations until it is considered that you've learned your lesson. Mr. Foster, you will count the strokes. Mr. Amazine, carry out your orders. Aye, aye, sir. One, two, three. Captain Thompson. What are you doing on the quarter deck? Who are you? I want to talk to you. I'm Charles Stewart. Get back to your watch. I said my name is Stewart. My father owns this ship. So? I demand that you take me back to Boston and put me ashore. How long will it take? About a year, if we're lucky. There's no time for jokes. One of the things I never take to see is a sense of humor. Your mark is signed on the ship's articles. I don't make marks. I sign my name. I was Shanghai. The law doesn't require me to be an authority on signatures. You'll serve as one of the crew and be treated as one. I don't intend living with that rabble. You'll take me back or lose command of the ship. Mr. Stewart, whether I remain in command of this ship or any other ship is of little moment. But as long as I do command her, you may be sure that I, w I shall remain her captain and that she will stay on her course. Mr. Amazine? Yeah. Turn him through with a crew. Here's your grub. Quite been also prepared by the finest cook of Plexi. Well, put the kettle down, Dooley. Come on, mates. You got to eat sooner or later. Even this stuff. Yeah, it may be moldy, Macklin, but think of Bellamy changing the hold on quarter rations. I haven't forgotten about Bellamy. 
And one of these days... Do you mind your tongue? That sneaking skunk Foster, he's just waiting to pin something on us. This fool. Today, this Foster and Amazine, Captain Thompson. <laughs> I don't laugh at him. He's never been to sea before. I'm a farmer. My wife, my children, they don't know where I am or what to do. Buck up, eh? Easy, buck up. I'll let him alone. Dana, come and fill your plate. Besides, this is no time to be writing letters home. This is no letter I'm writing. What is it, then? Well, it's a sort of diary, I suppose. You see, unlike most of you, I signed for this voyage voluntarily. <laughs> I told you he was crazy. <laughs> I want to write about this ship. And the men who sail it. Why? Oh, hello, Stuart. I thought you were on watch. I am, but I'm hungry. I'll go on watch after I eat. You call this food? Maybe you'll be feeding with the captain since you're the owner's son. Yeah. And since when have you been willing to sit down with us? With common sailors? I've avoided it so far. I can avoid it still longer. I'm going up on deck. Sam Hooper, sir. I worked in your father's office. But I always wanted to go to sea. Why? I wanted to live on a ship. And now I'm on one. Yes, and what a ship. Just what are you going to do? Well, I... I thought you might explain to the captain on account of he works for your father. I'm afraid I can't, son. I don't seem to carry much weight for the captain. Well, someone's coming. Still leave the cook. Get down the dory. So you don't like my cooking, Mr. Stewart? No, I don't. Well, I don't blame you. It's the grub they give me to cook. But this is different. Here, in the pot. Take a sniff of this. Roast chicken, Mr. Stewart. And the nearest you'll get to it till you're ashore again. Who's that chicken for? For his this Captain Thompson. Oh, the mates get fancy cooking, too. I take them theirs later. He's gone, Sam. It was chicken, wasn't it? I never knew I could get so awful hungry. When did you eat last? It's been so long, I can hardly remember. So the mates get chicken later, do they? And it's in the galley now. Stay where you are, Sam. I'll be right back. All hands are on deck, Sam. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Amazon. Gentlemen, this is the second occasion I found it necessary to muster this crew for reasons of discipline. One of you has stolen the mate's food from the galley. I do not propose to go to the trouble of individual question and search. But if the thief does not step forward at once, I shall presume the entire crew guilty, and you will be put on hard tack and water until further orders. Well? Very well, then. So it shall be. Take over, Mr. Amazine. Go below the watch. Watch on deck, turn two. Stuart. What do you want, Maxon? Get dirty bilge rat. Why don't you speak up and take what's coming to you? Why should I? There ain't a sailor alive who'll do what you just done to your shipmates. I saw you. You were standing there by the dory. You were eating something. Yes, yes, roast chicken, Mac, and I, I found it very tasty. And now you're going after and report it was you who stole it. If you don't, we'll take care of you right here. Let him alone, men. Turn him loose. Why? Because you could beat him to a pulp, but it wouldn't teach him anything. He isn't worth dirtying your hands. Just keep out of our way, Stuart. That won't be too difficult, then. Come on. Let's get below. Inspected the dory, Captain. There he was, sir. This boy. The stowaway, are you? What's your name? Sam Hooper, sir. He had this pan with him, sir. That's where our chicken went. Did you steal it? Well, I... Yes, sir. I was awful hungry. Why did you board this ship? I want to be a sailor, sir. Huh? Very laudable ambition. Sign him on as a cabin boy, Mr. Foster. Oh, and, uh... You can put the crew back on rations. Aye, aye, sir. Thank you very much, sir. I... Come along, you... How's your writing coming, Dana? Oh. Oh, uh, pretty good, Macklin. What's uh, that you've just written? This? This is about Bellamy. Oh. His punishment was sickening. A human being made in God's likeness lashed like a beast. How long he will live is hard to say. 
sometimes I'm able to steal to the hole and give him a little bread and water. That's as far as I've gone. Uh, I've been thinking about you, Dana. We had a young fellow last trip called Dana, too. Died a few days out. We, uh, buried him off Rio. I know. He was my brother. Your brother? You must like writing, Dana. Yes, I do, Mr. Foster. It's not often a man off watch will spend his time writing. It's going to be a book. I don't know. Maybe. Can I see it sometime? I hope you will, Mr. Foster. Sometime. Thanks. I look forward to it. Mr. Dana. Oh, hello, Sammy. Mr. Dana, why don't you and the rest of the men like Mr. Stewart? Do you like him, Sammy? Yes, sir, I do. Even though he let you take the blame that day for stealing the chicken? But nothing happened to me, Mr. Dana. Besides, he stole it from me. But he ate it. Just one piece, Mr. Dana. He made me eat all the rest. Sam, what are you trying to tell me? Well, I was hiding in the dory, and I told him how hungry I was. Is this he... the truth? Yes, sir. It's the truth. Thanks, Sammy. So I want to apologize, Stuart. After Sammy told me what really happened, I... Forget it. Doesn't matter. But it does matter. And I'm afraid you'll learn how much it matters before this voyage is out. Anything else, Nina? Except I... Battle station. Just drill. Better look lively, though. Macklin tells me the captain takes this very seriously. Yeah, there ain't enough work on this ship. We've got to fool with a cannon. Yeah, break our back so he can play. He's still in the Navy. Instead of being kicked out. Oh, watch out. Here comes Amazon. Why, you bill scum... You aren't fit to try the same check with him. I suppose his being kicked out was a mistake. It's no mistake when the captain of a 20-gun sloop sinks a 48-gun frigate, standing there with a quarter-deck being shot to splinters around him, until he goes down wounded, and his master gunner runs to help him, and the next day, giving that gunner 20 lashes for leaving the station during action. And you gave him the flogging. I got the flogging. Number one gun, Braxes, fire! They don't court martial like that. They ship twice its size. No, but they do if he's always disobeying admirals. But he knew more and fought better than all the admirals put together. Number two gun, practice, fire! No, oh, very slovenly. Reload and stand by. Mr. Amazine! Number four gun ready, sir. Hold your fire. Where's Mr. Foster? At number three gun, sir. Mr. Foster is not on deck. Send a man below and find him. Why, why weren't you at your post, Mr. Foster? You had six minutes to go to the powder magazine and return. I was returning from the magazine, sir, when Stewart hit me. Is this true, Stewart? Yes, sir. I hit him twice. Mr. Amazine, ring that man out. Why'd you hit him, Mr. Stewart? What happened? It doesn't matter now, Sammy. Better get out, Stewart. Mr. Amazine, dismissed from battle stations. Form all hands to witness punishment. Secure! And all hands must arrive! Stewart, the punishment for striking an officer is 20 lashes, well laid on. Disobedience to orders in battle practice, 10 lashes. If the offense had been committed in battle, you would have been hanged. In view of the obvious fact this is your first voyage, I propose to remit 10 lashes. Mr. Ramazine, have the cook stand by with some brine. Mr. Foster, count the 20 list strokes. Aye, aye, sir. Get the salt cook and leave the cabin boy in the galley. Proceed with the punishment. Aye, aye, sir. One. Two. Eight. Four. This. Five. It's a long six. Voyage, Mr. Foster. Seven. Uh, eight. I wonder if we nine, live to see it out. Ten. You. Eleven. And twelve. And thirteen. Thompson. Fourteen. In a moment, we'll return with the second act of Two Years Before the Mast. Meanwhile, here's Libby Collins, our Hollywood reporter. What's on your list tonight, Libby? Ride the pink horse, Mr. Keeley. A wooden horse on a merry-go-round in a little New Mexican town. Oh, you're talking about the new Universal International picture. Mm -hmm, that's it. I was completely charmed with the set the studio had built. And as you know, Mr. Keeley, they reproduced an entire New Mexican village at fiesta time. Ride the Pink Horse has the unusual distinction of being directed by its own star, Robert Montgomery. And Bob does a wonderful job in both capacities. 
It's an exciting story of a war veteran and a gang leader, with Andrea King playing, of all things, a gangster sweetheart. Such a delicate, lovely-looking person. I could hardly imagine her in such a role. Well, she's such a versatile actress. She makes the part entirely convincing. And furthermore, in any role she plays, I can say she has glamour. You know Andrea King. What do you think, John Kennedy? I'd enjoy seeing her in any role. She has real beauty, cameo-like features set off by a lovely luxe complexion. And she told me just how she cares for that delicate skin of hers. Active lather facials with luxe toilet soap, Libby? You're right, John. Every single day. Here's what she does. Smooths the fragrant luxe soap lather well in. Rinses with warm water, then cold, and packs with a soft towel to dry. She says it's amazing the way skin takes on fresh new loveliness. No wonder nine out of ten famous screen stars recommend these beauty facials with Lux Toilet Soap. They're such a wonderfully effective care. Recent tests show that. Skin specialists found that actually three out of four complexions improved in a short time with daily Lux Soap care. So here's a suggestion for the ladies in our audience. Try these active lather facials regularly. Remember... Gentle Lux Toilet Soap is Hollywood's own complexion care. Doesn't your complexion deserve it, too? Here's Mr. Keeley at the microphone. We continue with Two Years Before the Mast, starring Alan Ladd as Charles, Howard De Silva as Captain Thompson, MacDonald Carey as Dana, and Wanda Hendricks as Maria. <laughs> The brig Pilgrim, full canvas to the wind, whips through the South Atlantic. Ships and crew alike under Captain Thompson's iron hand, straining for a new speed record. Below in the forecastle, Charles Stewart lies on his bunk. Is that you, Dana? Yes. Don't try to move. Your back must feel like fire. Who brought me down here? Macklin and Sam and I. Thanks. We do the same for any shipment. Stewart... When battle stations were sounded, I hit my book carefully away. Now it's lying out on my bunk. That's what started my fight with Foster. I saw him down here. He'd taken your book. Why didn't you report him? You might have saved yourself the flogging. Hitting him was worth it. How's Dalton? He's dying down in that hole. You any idea where we are? Off Brazil. We'll be putting in a pen and buco soon. We'll be able to get ashore, get fresh food. Things will be better, Stuart. Will they, Dan? I wonder. What's the matter, mates? Why ain't you eating? Ah, nobody can eat this stuff. Not even us. It's been dead a hundred years. Smell it yourself. What's going on down here? Oh, I'm glad you stopped by, Mr. Foster. Look at our place. The stuff's crawling. We got a right to decent food? Sure you have. I'll tell the captain. You'd like to blab what goes on down here, wouldn't you? That knife put it on you. I'll put it through your throat Brown, before I... don't be a fool. Hey, I wasn't going to tell the captain. It was Amazine I was going to tell. Tell him what, Mr. Foster? That, that we need fresh provisions. Then tell him. Tell him now. And in case you change your mind, Foster, just remember. Well, I may get a flog and I'll be hanged, maybe. Before I do, you'll feel this knife right up to the hilt. Now, get out of here. Come on, Stuart. We'd better get on deck. Dana, what about Foster? Can we tell about Brown pulling in there? I don't think so. Foster's scared of us now. What if Brown had stabbed him before? He'd be hanging from that yard arm. He'd have a trial first, wouldn't he? No, he wouldn't. Aboard any merchant ship, a sailor hasn't got a chance. He's just an animal to be worked to death. Starved. Flogged. But it's going to change sometime. It has to. Perhaps you've come to realize that. Hmm. I never thought much about it until I felt that lash on my back. That's why I'm writing my book. If only I can get it published, if people will read it. The ship owners will be your worst enemies. And my father for one. Outside of Thompson, your father is my chief example. I'm going to... But there's... Look over there. It's land. Not too good. 
The ship. You slow down. Yes, we're coming into Prim and Bucum. We're stopping to take on passengers. You, you shouldn't have come down here, Stuart. If you're caught, you'll get the cat again. Mm, you let me worry about that. We're all bringing you something back from shore. Fruit, vegetables. We'll get it down to you. You'll be all right, Thelma. You're going to be fine. Thanks, mate. We've been sighted from shore, Mr. Anderson. They're sending up rockets. Now, where would I put the passengers, sir? In Foster's cabin. Tell him the berth of the crew. Aye, aye, sir. Shall I stand by with the anchor? No. Huh? We're not going to anchor. The passengers will be rowed out in the dory. We'll take them aboard and we'll be back to the main Thompson. I'm begging your pardon, sir, but we're in need of fresh provisions. I provision for this voyage in Boston. Yes, sir, but the salt horse is bad and there's grumbling in the forecastle. The salt horse is always bad and there's always grumbling in the forecastle. Well, the short rations, sir, there may be trouble. I think I can handle any trouble on my ship, Mr. Amazon. Stand by to pick up the passengers. This is your cabin, madam. I I had not been informed my passengers would be women. The cabin would serve us very nicely, Captain Duncan. Oh, at least you speak English. Where's the other woman, your maid? On the deck, I believe, worrying about our luggage. I'll have it sent in directly. I should warn you, Miss Dominguez, this is the first time ladies have been carried on this ship. You will kindly stay in this cabin as much as possible. As you wish, Captain Thompson. And please hold yourself completely aloof from any contact with the crew. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'll see about your baggage. Uh, that's all your baggage, miss? Oh, just drop the box in the corner, Sam. Yes, sir. Who's that, Joe? Come to Yamas. Que come to Yamas. My maid wants to know your name. Well, I'll be very happy oh, to... Oh, not it. you, senor. The boy. Me? Oh, Sam Hooper, ma'am. I'm an apprentice seaman aboard this ship. <clears throat> oh, oh, and this is my friend, Mr. Stewart. <sighs> Thank you, Sam. So, um... So you're going to Monterey? No, uh, to San Francisco. You'd be with us the whole trip? We hadn't expected ladies aboard it. We had had the cabin much cleaner. Can I uh, give any further help? No, thank you. Oh, uh, uh, here. Oh, uh, for me? For both of you. <laughs> Look at this coin, Sam. A picture of the Queen of Spain. Gosh, she's beautiful. She looks like you, miss. Save the compliments, Sam. I think she wants us to go. If you don't mind. Well, uh, thanks for the tip, Miss... Uh, 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 Dominguez. Maria Dominguez. Miss Dominguez. I hope you'll be comfortable. Uh, Sam, do you mind if I keep this coin? Oh, no. You carried all the heavy things anyway. Thanks, I'll make it up to you later. Dominguez, I didn't know you were on deck. Oh, it's much better than the stuffy cabin, Mrs. Stewart. How's your maid? Poor master, this. Still seasick. They say after we pass Cape Horn, the weather will be fine. Sam tells me the rounding of Cape Horn is a great event in a sailor's life. Yes, it's turning out that way. Well, you know, I've, I've wanted to talk to you ever since you came aboard. Won't you get into trouble? It would be worth it. I... I should like to talk to you also. About Sam. He seems so hungry. He is hungry. He didn't bring us our meals today. We've been sharing them with him. He's sick, Mr. Lincoln. Not seasick. It's something much worse. Well, if it's true, you owe me. Why can't you tell the captain to put him to the nearest pole? You don't know our captain. Why do you have to obey him? Sam says your father owns the pilgrim. Mm. He does. But at sea, the captain's the law. Yes? The wind is mounting. I must ask you to go to your cabin. Stuart, what are you doing here? Setting top the lifeline, sir. Have you finished? Yes, sir. Then get where you belong. Come in, come in. Well, Mr. Amazon? I've come to report, sir. There's sickness in the crew. I've just looked at Hayes, and he's got it all right. Scurvy. Cabin boy, too. Bellamer. Bellamer's dead. Bellamer, who's... The prisoner, sir. He's been in irons almost since Boston. Oh, yes. Yes, he attacked you with a knife. Very well. I'll conduct burial services at eight, eight bells. Yes, sir. The captain, if the scurvy spreads, we can't work the ship. We're long past Cape Horn, son. I thought if, well, we could put in somewhere... The ship will the... not put in anywhere. The winds have failed. Listen, we've three days to make up as it is. We've sailed with a few cases of scurvy before, Mr. Amity. Aye, sir. 
How many fresh supplies are left? One and a half bags of potatoes and one of onions. We're, we're running very short, sir. Very well. From now on, they're to be served only to the passengers. I'll tell the ship's cook, sir. Come back to your watch. Mr. Amazing. It's Mr. Foster, sir. Well, answer him. What is it, Mr. Foster? Another dead. Seaman Hayes. All right, Mr. Stewart. On this ship, the captain is the law. What makes you say that? Tonight, after the burial ceremony, I asked him what kind of a man he is. Kill human beings and then to stand there and pray for their souls. Oh, please, don't you make an enemy out of him, too. He sent me to my cabin. He said I was overlooked. You should have stayed in your cabin. I... I wanted to see you. How... How is Sam? No better. About the same Maybe the sickness will go away now. The weather is getting cooler. And you'll be home in six weeks. The wind holds good. Six more weeks. Well, you don't seem very happy about it. it it's merely that, that I have not been home for a very long time. You see, I was sent to a convent in Madrid when I was ten years old. I think you'll find living in California a lot different than Spain. I suppose so. The windows of my father's hacienda, there's nothing to see but the California hills. But from the windows of my school in Spain, I could see all Madrid, even the king and queen when they rode by. Oh, uh, do you know I carry a picture of the queen? You do? Mm-hmm. This coin. Remember you gave this to Sam in the eye, asking if I could keep it. You shouldn't. Why not? Two weeks after I arrived in California, I shall be married. Married? How long has it been since you've seen him? Since I left California. Oh, but you're only a child then. I'm going to marry him. Our marriage was arranged by his parents and mine. Does that make it right? Is your way the American way any better? Entrusting a daughter to anyone she chooses? Someone you may never have seen and whose name you do not know until she tells you? What about love? Doesn't that enter into it? You mustn't talk like that, please. Maria. Yes. I will always carry the likeness of the Queen of Spain. It's here what I got to show you, down in this hold. What are you trying to hide, Brown? Why'd you bring me down here? When I light the candle, you'll see. Foster's dead, Mr. Ramsey. I killed him a few minutes ago. Look about you, Mr. Ramazine. Half a sack of potatoes and a basket of onions. Foster stole these from the galley. When I followed him in here, he offered me half, not to tell. Well, you killed him. Sick men and a sick boy in a forecastle, and he had this all the time. He had this while his shipmates were dying of scurvy. I killed him, and I'd do it again. Why are you telling me? So you can take me to Thompson. I want to get it over with. Take this food to the forecastle and divide it. I'll take care of Foster's body. You're, you're not reporting me? Just get this food to the men and keep your mouth shut. Ramsey, now this isn't your watch, Stuart. What are you doing on deck? May I talk to you? Ryan. Brown told me about Foster. What have you done about him? I dropped his body overboard, told the captain, and formed him from the rigging. He said it was too dark to lower a boat and try to find him. Thanks, Ramsey. I'll get below. Oh, there's something else. By dawn, we'll be inside of land, won't we? If the wind holds. Macklin says that the islands of Mexico, he says they've got food there. Fresh food. I'm not the master of the ship. But we've got to stop some of these men are half dead. Get below before... I'll do what I can, sir. I'm quite aware that we've sighted land, Mr. Amazine. Those are the Clarion Islands. We've made up almost two days. Then shall I alter course, sir? Alter? Our course is Monterey, Mr. Amazine. Captain Thompson, as first mate of the ship, it's my duty to warn you that unless we take on supplies, there'll be mutiny. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Amazine. I'll enter your remarks in the log. Who's in charge of the deck? I am, sir. But I had Dana take over while I reported to you. In view of the proximity of land, shouldn't the mate of the watch be absent as little as possible from his responsibility? Very good, sir. No use talking about it. Thompson's not going to all our course. You're right, Mac. There is no use talking, but we can do something about it. We can go up on deck and take over the ship. Or would you rather stand by and see Sam and the others dumped overboard like Hayes and Bellina? It'd hang for mutiny, Stuart. I'll have to wait. Where's Dana? Still with Sam. 
And what has to be done can be done alone. Thompson's on the quarterdeck. His cabin's empty, and there are guns in his cabin. Wait here, Oliver. What's the course, Mr. Amazine? No, west by north, sir. Very well, we'll hold it as long as the wind lasts. When or not, we're making for those islands. Where did you get those pistols? From your cabin. I trust you know the penalty for mutiny? Let's say that my father owns this ship and I demand you make for land. You're a fool, Stuart. Are you going to change course? Yes. Yes, I choose to remain alive to enjoy the pleasure of turning you over to the proper authorities. Mr. Amazing? Yes, sir? You will bear witness that I, everything I'm doing is under duress? Ready about? Aye, aye, sir. All hands to station! Make ready to come aboard! Keep your hands at your side, Mr. Thompson. You'll come to no harm. But I... Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Amazine. You always were handy with a belaying pin. Pick him up. Amazine. Yes, Stuart. I hit you with that pin. Whatever I am, I'm no mutineer. I'd, uh, I'd like to hang you now, Stuart, but mutiny demands a trial before a proper court. I had my chance to kill you, and I didn't. But someone will one of these days. And when the people back home learn the things I've learned, they'll... They'll run butchers like you clear of the seas. Take them below. Put them in irons. Helmsman! I... We will hold the car. Steady as she goes! We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. In a moment, we'll return with Act Three of Two Years Before the Mast. For most girls, an 18th birthday is a pretty important occasion. Our guest tonight, however, Miss Barbara Chalice, had special reason to celebrate hers. Right, Barbara? Yes, Mr. Keeley. That was the day I signed my contract with Universal International. And now you're a full-fledged motion picture actress. Not every girl achieves her ambition so young. Mm, but look how long I worked for it. I started at 12, modeling children's fashions. Then I became a photographer's model. And a talent scout saw my picture. So here I am in Hollywood, where I've always wanted to be. And enjoying your new career, I take it. Oh, it's really exciting to see how pictures are made. I spent hours watching them film the last moment. Mm, a very interesting psychological drama. Oh, and the set was fascinating in itself. An ancient castle, complete with high iron gates, secret rooms, and spiral staircases. Mm. It really was scary. Did you meet the stars, Robert Cummings and Susan Hayward? I did, Mr. Keeley, and they were very gracious to me. It was a thrill to see Susan Hayward, who plays the mysterious heroine of the lost moment. Susan is youth and beauty in person. Oh, yes, Mr. Keeley. With her flaming red hair and gorgeous complexion, Susan Hayward is strikingly lovely. Uh, I imagine Mr. Kennedy here will be interested in what she told me about her complexion care. It's no secret, Barbara, that Susan Hayward is an enthusiastic Lux girl. It would be hard to find a lovelier example of a Lux complexion than hers. I agree, Mr. Kennedy. One look at Susan Hayward's exquisite skin, and any girl would be convinced that Lux Toilet Soap Care really works. It has to work when nine out of ten screen stars depend on it so faithfully. Mm, and many a girl on the way up, too. Here's one who never neglects her daily Lux Soap Care. I wish our audience could see that radiant complexion of yours. Thank you, Miss Barbara Chalice, for coming tonight. Now, here's something any woman who wants softer, smoother skin can do. Get some of Hollywood's own beauty soap, fragrant white Lux Toilet Soap, tomorrow. Use it regularly and see if you don't agree. Lux girls are lovelier. Back now to William Keeley. Here's the third act of Two Years Before the Mast, starring Alan Ladd as Charles, Howard the Silver as Thompson, McDonald Carey as Dana, and Wanda Hendricks as Maria. A few days have passed, and the Brig Pilgrim has now approached the port of Monterey, California. In prison in the hold, Charles Stewart has a visitor. Maria, you should have come down here. Nobody saw me. I, I brought you some food. Oh, thanks. Have you heard how Sam is? He's a little strong, but poor boy. I've been sending him some of our food by Mr. Dan. Maria, why did you really come down here? 
because I... I thought of you. Even if you cared a little, you... You wouldn't tell me, would you? He couldn't make any difference. I told you my whole life has been planned. It will always be that way, don't you understand? Perhaps I couldn't Spanish, but in English it just doesn't make sense. I know. I remember you said it that way. You... You'd better go. Yes. We'll be in Monterey this afternoon. I... I'll see you again as soon as I can, John. Thank you, Maria. There's the port of Monterey, Mr. Amazine. Aye, sir. We'll anchor here in the bay until Don Sebastian has come aboard and cleared us. You may take in the courses. Aye, aye, sir. Oh, we've established a new record for the boys, Mr. Amazine. You may hoist the record pennant. Welcome aboard the Pilgrim, Don Sebastian. Captain Thompson, how good to see you again. Uh, and this? This is Senorita Maria Dominguez, Don Sebastian Peralta, mayor of Monterey. Don Sebastian. Senorita, before my men rowed me to the ship, I dispatched a messenger to your father in San Francisco. How happy he will be to know you will soon be home again. Thank you, Don Sebastian. And uh, when will you proceed to San Francisco, Captain? Well, as soon as we've unloaded our cargo. I'd like to dock on the morning tide. Here are my papers. In addition, a complete report of a mutineer whose trial I wish you would convene immediately. Mutiny? Excellencia. Si, que gusto de verla. Tengo algo que decirle acerca del señor Stuart. Si. Conozco al Capitán Thompson y sé que no dirá la verdad. May I suggest, madam, that since I cannot speak your tongue, you might express yourself in English? I was telling Don Sebastian he would never get the truth from you. I was also going to say that, in my opinion, Mr. Stuart is not guilty of anything. He only tried to save the lives of sick men. And two of them died. They died because of your brutality. You'll find complete details in this paper, Don Sebastian. I am sorry, senorita, but the captain has full power to demand a trial. Thank you. I trust there will be no delay. As you wish, captain. Tomorrow morning at 11. Stuart, are you awake? Stuart. Who is it? Dana. I've got Macklin and Brown with me. All right, all right. What are you doing down here? The captain's just issued orders. There'll be no shore leave. So we're jumping ship, Stuart. All of us. And you're coming with us. We'll have you free in no time. It's taking a pretty long chance, Dana. We know that. I mean, helping me to escape. Before a jury, you won't have a chance against Thompson. Where are we going? We don't know yet. We'll take the dory and get the shore. Well, what about the passengers? Mr. Mingus and the maid. We'll have no time for visiting, Stuart. Let's get to work on those chains. Leg arms first, Brown. We'll cut the handcuffs later. Watch the report in the hold of the ship, Mr. Amazine, and prepare cargo for unloading. Yes, sir. They're getting back to shore leave, sir. Well, if we're able to unload the full cargo tomorrow, each watch may have two two hours of sh- What is that? What's that noise? What's going on for it? Well, it's the crew, sir. They're blowing a boat. Order them to return, Mr. Amazine. Board ahoy! Get back on board! And what if we don't? You will take the consequences, Dana. I order you to put about. We're jumping ship, Captain Thompson. Very well. Sam. Duck down, boy. Duck, he's got a rifle. Stand aside, Mr. Amazon. Was that deliberate, Mr. Amazon, knocking my rifle aside? Yes, sir. Very well. You take the rifle, then, Mr. Amazon. I'm ordering you to fire on that dory. Sir, I've plugged and driven those men because that was my duty. But I don't kill my shipmates for you because that's murder. Mr. Amazon, you are no longer first mate of this vessel. That's all right with me, Captain Thompson. Dana! Dana, wait for me! Amazon! Amazon, come back here! Do you hear me? I order you to return. I'm joining you, mate. I'm leaving the ship. I'm coming, Sammy. Send me a hand, Stuart. Amazing, you want to come into water? He's been hit. Get on the orders before I can reload. Amazing. I never thought he'd do that to me. He's dead. Amazon's dead. All of you, back to the ship. Do you hear me? He wants us back, does he? I say go back. Yeah, go back and take the ship. Wait a minute. Wait for what, Dana? Ask the men what they want. Do we jump ship or do we put around and take over? We go back. back. Take over. There's your answer, Dana. We're coming back to the ship, Captain Thompson. Maria, it's all right. You can open the door now. Well, what? What's happened? All that fighting and shooting. We're taking the ship. Captain Thompson. He's dead. Charles, no. 
Not you. No, but I could have done it gladly. It was Macklin. He, he's dead, too. We're putting you and your mate ashore, Maria. And we're pulling out of here. It would be dangerous getting us to shore. We can stay. I don't care where we go as long as you are safe. Oh, but you can't stay on the ship. I don't know what's going to happen to me or to any of us. Stuart, come here. Wait in the cabin, Maria. I'll be right back. Stand by, Stuart, with that rifle. What's happened? There's a skip coming alongside with soldiers. It's the harbor patrol. Now out of sight, men. All of you. Ahoy! Brig Pilgrim! I heard that! We were just celebrating our record voyage. Sorry we alarmed you. Where is your Capitan? He's left orders not to be disturbed. I think I had better come aboard. You and your men, sir, stay just where you are. Stuart, Brown, Dooley. Make a move and we'll fire. Senor. Stand by to slip anchor, men. Put our passengers, Dana. Let the harbor patrol take them ashore. Then bring them here at once. We can't turn them loose now. They'll spill the whole story. It won't matter. The wind's with us and there isn't a ship in the harbor to follow us. Get the girl and her maid. There's no time to lose. Maria, I... I don't know how or when I'll be back. But promise me you'll wait for me. Tell it! We're back! I promise you. Come back to May we proceed now, senor? Cast off and head for shore. Take the wheel, Stuart. Hold her as she goes. Aye, sir. Northwest by west. Men, we've been a full day at sea. For a while, we'll have nothing to worry about. But here and now, we've got to make up our minds where we're going. We know where we're going, Dana. First, we're going to put in somewhere and get food aboard. And after that? We head for the Orient. They'll hunt us down in every port in the world. You got a better idea? Yes. We should put about for Boston, give ourselves up, and tell them exactly what happened and why. We're going to sell the cargo and for once live like human beings. Then we will be hunted down like pirates. And people will go on saying that seamen should have no rights. What Dana says makes sense. Well, that's all very well for you, Stu, the ship owner's son. But they'll string us up. I may be a ship owner's son, but I'm also a seaman now. And I have an interest in that book that Dana's writing. He can help American sailors get a different kind of life. But it's no use unless the men he's defending have the courage to back him up. Take this ship back home like freeborn Americans. Face the charges. Prove that what we did was justified. But you've got the ship. It's up to you. I'll camp along, Dana. Me too. Thanks, Sammy. I'm with you. I'll take a chance, too. All right. What about you, Bob? Well, if it's a war, all right. As soon as there's sea room, Dana, let's come about. Thank you, Brown. We're going home, then. We're going back to Boston. Boston, Massachusetts, April 10, 1836. The Brig Pilgrim, Stewart Shipping Company, boarded by customs officials in Boston Harbor. Mutiny reported in Pacific Ocean. Captain and officers dead. Entire crew is under arrest. See your son now, Mr. Stewart. Thank you, Warden. Hello, Father. Charles, it's good to see you again, even under these circumstances. Now, I don't want you to worry. My lawyer will have you out of here tomorrow. Well, thanks, Father, but I'm staying here with the rest of the crew. Staying with them here in prison? I want to face the charges. What we did was justified. Dana's book will prove that. It's going to be public. Let's well, not go into it, Charles. You'll be out on bail tomorrow. No, Father. Whatever happens to them, I'm sharing it. You've changed, Charles. I'm glad. Thank you, Father. Nip Mears' book sold out in Boston. Public aghast at charges made in book. Two years before the map, center of great controversy. United States Senate takes over investigation of Nip Do you have anything further to tell us, Mr. Dana? Yes, Senator Barnes. None of us can offer a better defense than the testimony just delivered by Mr. Mingus. Her timely arrival here in Washington was more than we even dared hope for. I do have one thing more to say, though. We all knew that the penalty for mutiny is hanging, yet we willingly brought our ship home to face the charges for the good of those who will continue to sail American ships. Mr. Charles Stewart. Yes, sir. The Attorney General is awaiting the decision of this senatorial committee. Do you have a final statement? Please make it now. Whether we live or die, Senator, is a matter of law. 
But the only law that a sailor has ever known is the personal decision of his captain. If a sailor objects, he's sentenced to starvation, flogging, or even death. Gentlemen, it will stay that way as long as the government allows it to, whether sailors die or not. If you believe that we've told the truth, we beg you to make just laws to protect the lives of the men who serve our country on the seas. We, we leave that decision to you. This investigation stands adjourned. If there's cleared of all charges, Attorney General frees crew of pilgrims. Congress passes law protecting merchant seamen. Don't stay, Mr. Dunn. Not even for our wedding. I can hardly do that, Mr. Mingus, now that I'm first mate of the Pilgrim. We weigh anchor tonight. Well, good luck to you both. Thanks, Dana. A happy voyage. tonight's play, that two years at sea must boil down to a single hour on the air. But for that exciting hour, all our thanks to Alan Ladd, Howard De Silva, McDonald Carey, and Wanda Hendricks. Uh, Alan, a special thanks for your speedy return from New York to take part in tonight's play. I wouldn't have missed it, Bill. You know, uh, the first picture I ever made was a sea picture. A small part, but it took a lot out of me. What'd you do, Alan? I got seasick. <laughs> so realistically, as I recall, that you got the Critics Award for that performance. Howard, for such a congenial personality in real life, you certainly make a most distasteful villain on the screen. Well, you haven't seen anything yet. Will you see Cecil B. the Mills unconquered? What do you do in the picture, Mr. DeSilva? You see, it's through Howard that Paul Goddard gets tortured at the stake. Yep. I even hit myself in that one. <laughs> So much so, I understand you're off to see the premiere in Pittsburgh as soon as you finish tonight's broadcast. That's right, Alan. Well, Alan, I hope you treat Dorothy Moore better in your new Paramount picture, Wild Harvest. Mm, I'd say Dorothy treats us pretty rough in that picture, Bill. Were you in New York in connection with that picture, Alan? No, I was making some location shots and doing some vacationing. I read that you attended the Harvey Moon Bowl on your birthday. And 18,000 people sang happy birthday to you. 18,000 happy birthdays? Hey, that's some sort of a record, isn't it? Well, it really gave me a thrill. Wanda here has a birthday coming up next week. You're 19th, isn't it, Wanda? That's right, Mr. Keeley. Well, it's nice to know a woman who's so young she doesn't have to lie about her age. <laughs> and with such a lovely complexion that it's plain she uses Lux soap. Oh, I do indeed, Mr. Keeley. And always will. Lux has a wonderful complexion care. From a girl with a wonderful complexion, that's praise indeed. What are you presenting next week in this theater, Bill? Next Monday night, we put the accent on suspense with Universal International's spine-chilling hit, The Weather. And our stars are Ella Raines, Edmund O'Brien, and Vincent Price. That was one of Vincent Price's best performances, I thought, Bill. Yes, in a thrilling story of intrigue and detection. And a murder mystery that involves a man and woman in suspicion, danger, and romance. Well, that sounds like a mighty exciting evening, Bill. I wouldn't miss it. We'll be listening, Mr. Keeley. Good night. Good night, and Good night. for a four-star... Beaver Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Ella Raines, Edmund O'Brien, and Vincent Price in the web. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. Of us think of home as the safest place that we can be. Yet the National Safety Council finds that two thirds of all accidental deaths in the United States occur at home through hazardous conditions and personal carelessness. For your own sake and your families, check your home for such unsafe conditions as bad light, dangerous stairways, cluttered rooms, and unprotected play space. And cultivate habits of safe conduct, thoughtfulness, and reasonable caution. McDonald Carey appeared by arrangement with Paramount Pictures and is currently appearing in Paramount's 36-star production, Variety Girl. 
Wanda Hendricks appeared through the courtesy of Paramount Studios and is currently seen in Welcome Stranger, starring Bing Crosby. Heard in our cast tonight were Bill Johnstone as Amazine, Louis Van Rooten as Foster, William Roy as Sam, and Pat Hearn, Ira Grossell, Norman Field, Leo Cleary, Tyler McVeigh, Robert Griffin, Clark Gordon, George Sorrell, George Neese, Eddie Marr, Don Morrison, and June Whitley. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. This program is rebroadcast to our servicemen and women overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Our Lux Radio Theater production of two years before the mask has come to you with the good wishes of the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, Hollywood's own beauty soap, the complexion care used regularly by nine out of ten lovely screen stars. And this is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to join us again next Monday night to hear The Web with Ella Raines, Edmund O'Brien, and Vincent Price. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.